It's Tuesday. It's Harp Tuesday. Welcome to this week's episode. So today I want to talk about memorization. Not how to do it, but about the history of it in classical music, the history of memorization. And what sort of sparked the idea for this episode was I, this past July, I played Bux's harp concerto, his first harp concerto, at the World Harp Congress in Wales. And even though I had it memorized, I ended up using music mainly because I knew I was going to be pretty nervous and I just thought it would give a better performance and make it a more enjoyable experience for me. But of course the tradition now is for concertos or similar things to play it from memory. It hasn't always been the case and so I thought I would first give you a little bit of a, a history of this, of memorization in music, in classical music, and then talk about my own personal thoughts and experiences. So. Of course, for the longest time, all music was, was memorized in the sense there was no written music, and, and it would all be oral tradition, right? You'd play it, you'd maybe learn it from somebody else, and you'd play or sing a song or whatever the way they did, and then that maybe got changed over the years. And so the birth of the sort of notation, Western music notation, was also kind of the birth of classical music. And classical music is, in a way, you need to be able to precisely write down all these, many cases, you know, thousands of notes in a precise order, in a certain rhythm, a certain sound. And so written music, music notation, and classical music sort of went hand in hand. And that allowed then the possibility of not having a piece memorized, but playing it from the music. And so in fact, that was the norm for the Baroque period and the Classical period, was that people played from the music. And in fact, I remember reading once that, especially if you were playing someone else's composition, you wanted to have the music there to show that you weren't trying to pass it off as your own composition. But then that slowly changed. And as I was researching this, this episode, I came across a great article talking about the history of memorization in music. And I'll link to that in the video description down below, so check that out. And the author puts forth this idea that there were two main components that sort of made this, this, this change to now, where there's an expectation for so solo performances, a solo recital, that you will have the music memorized. There's two main reasons that this happened. And so the first reason has to do with the fact that in the Baroque period and in the Classical period, is a musician, one of, the, one of the skills that was highly valued was the ability to sight read. Because you were always playing new music. And it's funny, I think, for us to think about it now, but at the time, music, classical music, went out of fashion quite quickly. And I know I talked about this a little bit in my uh, Harpist in the Wild, the Baroque Feast, talking about Vivaldi and Bach, their music, especially once they died, just didn't get played for a long time. And that there was always this thirst for the new thing, the new fashion. You think about popular music now, yes, music from 20 years ago gets played, but it's not in necessarily the same demand as, as, as new music. And, and so as a musician, you were constantly playing new music. You also think about composers, they were largely supported by rich patrons, so that could be, uh, it could be nobility, it could be the church. And so you were writing for all these different occasions to celebrate a birth, to, to commemorate a death, for a feast day, for, for winning a war, whatever. All these, all these occasions. So always new music. And of course, you think about that classic story of Mozart writing the overture to an opera the afternoon of the actual premiere of the opera. So as a musician, you had to be able to sight read. You had to be able to quickly get new music and read it. And it was thought that memorizing it would interfere with that ability, right? You wanted to focus on eyes on the sheet music and not on the fingers. And that was still taught. I think many people who learned the piano into the 20th century might have been taught to never look at the fingers, right? And that, I think, is partly a remnant from this focus on the skill of sight reading, of, of being able to read, read ahead. And it, so this was a highly skilled, uh, a highly um, sought after skill, a highly advantageous skill. That's something you needed to do. And the other thing is that at that time, the, the sort of show off 
skill that, that you would demonstrate your, your, your virtuosity was improvisation, right? So you might take a theme and improvise on it. Or some great quotes again in this article of, of you know, people playing uh, a piece, a uh, concerto that somebody else has written, but then at various times improvising on it, right? And so in that sense, you didn't want to memorize because then there might be the suspicion that, oh, this isn't an improvisation, this is something you've previously prepared. The, the improvisation, the, the sort of the wow of that was that you came up with this on the spot. So this was the case for, as I say, for, for quite a bit of classical music history. And then I know uh, Clara, Clara Wieck, later Clara Schumann, she was maybe one of the first recorded instances of playing an entire recital from memory alone. And of course, uh, Liszt gets a lot of credit for sort of this idea of the musician as a rock star and not just a uh, servant to the music, as it were, but of a performance. And he for sure did a lot of uh, music from memory. He played all his music from memory. And at the same time, you had um, this push. So the Mendelssohns, for example, uh, were instrumental in this, the Bach revivals, this push or this, this movement, this sort of change of looking at older music and, and continuing to play it or bringing it back, reviving it. And there started to become this repertoire that would get played again and again. So previously, it, you could memorize a piece, but then you might only play it once. Whereas now you might play the same piece for your entire career. And so there became more of a payoff for memorization. At the same time, improvisation was sort of going away. It wasn't as, yeah, it was more that the composer would write out every note and you weren't expected to improvise, you were expected to play every note. And so this, it's kind of sad in a way, like I think we, we lose something like from that, that classical music no longer values or teaches improvisation. But then that also meant, or at least this article suggests, that instead of improvisation being the way to show off, memorization became a way to show off, right? To be able to play an entire program from memory was an impressive feat. And I think even now, it's still, I mean, we take it for granted because everyone does it. But I still get comments about people saying, oh, well, you, you know, was, you played the whole all concert from memory, that it, it, it still is, I mean, it is impressive, right? There's so many notes to be played just from memory. Um, it's not as hard as it might appear to someone who's not a musician, because again, it's not as if you're memorizing thousands upon thousands of individual notes, it's all about chunking. Um, but it, it does come across as a Im potentially impressive thing. So we really had this sea change, and there's some great quotes in there, again, sort of this, to start with a lot of resistance against memorization with the idea that how would you be able to stay true to what the composer had written? Of course, you would have to, at some point, make some mistakes or, or, or improvise or, you know, without the music there. And that, oh, it was too much, too much taking attention away from the music and putting it on the musician and all, all this stuff. But it, did catch on, it did become the, the, as it is now, the sort of the standard for certain things. And again, it's kind of funny that we have like a solo piano, the ex expectation is memorized, but if you're playing, accompanying a violinist, right, say a, a sonata, piano would traditionally have music now still, and the violinist could have music or could not, right? Um, and, and so all these sort of different corner cases. Or opera, of course, there's no music, which, I mean, makes sense because you're trying to act as well. But oratorios, the tradition still is to have the music, even though it's actually a lot less to memorize, typically, for a soloist than, uh, than an opera. So again, all these interesting little traditions that exist. But uh, we had this, this, this sea change. And it's, in a way, it was a bit of an arms race that is a performer. If, if, if you're the only one doing it, that's pretty impressive, right? And wow. Then as everyone starts doing it, it becomes a little bit more expected and normal. 
and suddenly now you have maybe this added pressure. And it is an added pressure. So again, there's some great quotes. I remember one not from Antoine Rubinstein, no, not from Arthur Rubinstein, but Antoine Rubinstein, the older Rubinstein, um, talking about how, oh, his memory was always so prodigious, no problem, until he turned 50. And then, oh, the audience couldn't imagine the, 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 the horrors that he went through, second only to the Inquisition of trying to play from memory. And it is, it can be quite stressful, right? Because especially now there's very much an expectation of perfection, of every note being perfect, because we hear so many recordings and then there's just the level of playing is so high. And to add to that, the memorization aspect can be tricky. And I know for myself, as I've gotten older, I don't memorize as effortlessly. In some ways, I've, I've, it maybe means I memorize better now because I've had to employ better strategies, but it is, it is not as easy. And I'm sure as I continue to get older, it will probably become more difficult. There's an article I'll also link to below, um, the loosening hold of, of memorization on uh, classical music or something. I don't know if that's true, it was from 2013, but talking about especially, yes, as people age, and I find Bach quite hard to memorize, and, and Bach is specifically referenced in this article of, as we get, as, as pianists age, it would be a pity not to hear them play Bach, for example, just because we feel they have to play it from memory. Um, and again, maybe adding repertoire, you get a certain repertoire that you're comfortable with, and it would be nice, I mean, as a listener, I'd love to hear a musician play some new repertoire that they're really interested in and that they really have something to say from memory, I mean, from, from, with the music, so that, yes, I mean, obviously the music you've played for years, the memory is maybe really, really solid, but wouldn't it be nice to then learn something new and play using the music, um, if that meant that you could play it? and feel comfortable about playing it. So on a more personal level, for me, of course, I've always felt that the most, hmm, the best performance came from having a piece memorized and the most satisfying, right? That to be able to just feel that the music is flowing, you, you think method, you think it and it comes out of your fingers and there it is. And it's a really wonderful relationship with the music. And I think it draws the listener in, right? I think to have nothing sort of interfering, nothing in between, and not to be glancing back and forth. The music stand with a harp in particular, even if you get the music quite close to the strings, there's a bit of back and forth. Visually, not to have the music stand in the way, because the harp is a nice visual instrument to watch. So for sure, I think the ideal is to have something memorized. But I also think that you have, that for me, I'm, I'm willing to play something with the music if I feel it will give the best performance. So, you know, sort of all told um, that maybe I can play it from memory, but I'm going to be really nervous and I'm not going to be able to relax and enjoy the music and let the music flow in the way that I might if I had some sheet music there. So, yeah, so it's about, and of course, obviously, sometimes maybe you're asked to play a piece quite on short notice. I remember doing uh, some concerto on, on, on a, like a couple months notice. And, and of course, I used the music because, uh, yeah, the, I, I just it was enough to learn the piece um, and play it well, and I didn't end up memorizing it. And so for me then, with this, with this Volkswagen concerto, I memorized the piece, and, and I, I really enjoyed memorizing it. And it, I was, yeah, I really enjoyed memorizing. And it, again, it's a slightly, it's a different experience. But then as it was getting closer to the date and I was just, you know, practicing performing and, and this, at the World Harp Congress, you're playing for all your peers, you're playing for a bunch of harpists. And I knew, and I also hadn't been doing any performing, right, with the pandemic. And I know that for me, it takes several performances. I think for a lot of people, it takes several performances of a piece to really solidify that you can do what you can, of course, in practice, but nothing is quite the same as actually performing it. 
And in this case, this would be the very first performance, actually the very the world premiere of this particular arrangement for uh, harp and then uh, string quartet plus clarinet and flute. And so to have the initial performance in this sort of high, potentially high stress environment, I decided I wanted to enjoy this as much as I could, and I wanted to give as good a performance as I could. And I decided that in the end, the best option for me would be to use the music. And I'm glad I did. The, the, a couple other factors involved there and that it was, it was in a group. And so this is, for example, an orchestra. Orchestras still use music. And I think in any group setting, there's an extra risk to memorization because if you're playing on your own and something goes wrong, you can just keep going and make something up and, and get out of it. But when you're playing in a group, that's harder to do, right? Because, you have, yeah, you can't just make stuff up. It has to match and fit with everyone else. So even though concertos are typically played from memory, there is this group aspect. Also, this was going to be an ensemble performance, no conductor. I was going to have to, in a sense, kind of try and conduct. Uh, I didn't know exactly how many rehearsals we were going to get, but I knew it wasn't going to be very many. And in fact, we only got one rehearsal. So I was going to try to also be, some part of my mind was going to be on trying to direct traffic, as it were, and trying to make sure that we stayed together. And so those were going to add some extra stress and extra brain power. And again, I just felt that having the music there was going to make it more relaxed for me and more enjoyable. Um, and so I definitely felt a bit sad as well about, as I, as I made that decision, started practicing from the music, because you, you, know, you have to practice from the music, even if you're using the music. Uh, that to get used to the page turns and, 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 and when you're going to look at the music or, or if you're not looking at music to know where on the music you are so that if you have to look at the music you will know where that is. So I definitely felt some sadness because I, again, the process of memorizing and, and playing from memory is an enjoyable experience and maybe I should have played it from memory but in the end I was very happy because I found that I wasn't as nervous as I thought I might be. I was able to really enjoy it um, and again, there was the, you know, just one rehearsal and some of the stresses that way. But for me, it was a, it was a good experience. And these days we have technology helps a little bit because with the iPad and a foot pedal, it means you don't have the distraction of turning the page, which maybe kind of takes you out, the audience out of the uh, performance a little bit. And you don't have to have a page turn, which is also a bit of a distraction. Um, and it can be pretty seamless. And so, for example, for piano, I think actually with a piano, there's not much difference from an audience perspective of having, say, some sheet music there or not, because uh, it's not really interfering with the view in the same way. The piano is actually a hard instrument to view because right, you can see the hands or you can see someone's face, but there's limited uh, viewing, good viewing angles. Whereas with the harp, for sure, having the music stand there is a little bit of a distraction or a little bit of an annoyance visually for an audience. But I think the iPad makes it, makes it easier. And again, with an iPad stand, just clipping the iPad onto a stand, a uh, mic stand, even a smaller visual footprint. And I wonder about the future, whether we will have, for example, glasses where maybe the, the what is it, augmented reality, where you might be able to see the music in your glasses as you're playing. So it might be that within the next 20 years that you might always have that option of having the music there. And again, it's not, it, it is a different experience to play from memory versus playing from the music. Um, so even if you have that option of always having the music there, you might ignore it or you might not use it, but it could be a nice, again, partly just a psychological thing, right? to know that it's there and you don't have to worry. Because, I don't know about for you, but for me, when I'm performing, I don't really worry about the technical stuff. Like, am I gonna pull off this jump? Am I gonna be able to play this passage fast enough? It's, it's always the, if, I, if some nervousness or doubt creeps into my mind, it's about memorization. And so certainly if you could remove that, that just makes for a, a better performance and better experience for you. And that hopefully translates on to the audience. 
So, yeah, I guess those are some interesting thoughts, that history of, of the changing from no memorization to all memorization. And then again, maybe now a little bit back and forth. So I went, one of the concerts that I went to on this big European trip that I just came back from was a performance of uh, Bartok Violin Concerto and the soloist used music and used music for the encore. And it was fine, like a fantastic performance, beautiful performance, didn't bother me in the least. Um, but again, there is sort of that expectation and that tradition. And so uh, I think from my point of view, I, I think it would be kind of nice if there was less of an expectation on memorization. But again, I do think by memorizing a piece, you potentially learn it in a potentially different and deeper way. And so even if you don't end up playing it from memory, I think the ability to memorize a piece or the process of memorizing a piece can be quite nice. What are your thoughts? Uh, it's funny because I know I have students that sometimes are on either extreme. Some people memorize really easily but struggle to read music. And some people sight read really, really well but struggle to memorize. And both of those camps are always, at least the ones I've encountered, have, are always kind of yearning for the thing that they don't have. The people who memorize really easy wish that they could sight read more fluently. And the people who sight read so easily wish that they could memorize. So in some ways, it's nice to just enjoy what you have. But again, the ideal would be a well-rounded that you can memorize and that you can sight read um, and you choose whatever feels best for you. So for you, do you memorize? Do you use music? Um, and for you as an audience member, how aware are you of is someone using music or not? And does that, does that actually affect your experience of the performance? Um, yeah, I'd love to hear that in the comments. Hope you've enjoyed this and I will see you in two weeks for another episode of Harp Tuesday. Cheers. Mm -hmm.